it to us, you know, if, if you if you really believe in liberty and freedom for all. And so there were individuals in the early 1800s, a movement, meaning a coordinated mass of people, didn't really begin until 1848 with the first women's rights convention that was called in upstate New York. And that really, that wave um, of, of a movement ended in 1920 um, with the passage of the 19th Amendment that gave women the right to vote. Um, but that's not the only thing that the women had been agitating for between 1848 and 1920. But what happens though is that then things kind of go down to individuals again. There are still individual women, and it really isn't another movement again until 1960 when President Kennedy uh, created the uh, Commission on the Status of Women. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and there's a whole second wave of feminism between 1960 and roughly 1989. And, uh, and so the second panel represents the women who were uh, the middle panel that we're looking at right now represents that. The third wave really is a whole new set of ideas, but not completely new, building on things that women have been uh, active and wanting for years, but in a new way since 1990. And we are in the third wave now. So the, the whole point of it is that there have been different emphasis and, uh, and there's a difference between individual women activists and a mass movement. And a mass movement. So, you know, working with you on this project was really amazing. Um, but the most amazing thing was how did, how did we get to these four women representing each way? Because we know there are a lot more, but tell us about the process, the thinking that you went through to help us select. These are kind of the pivotal women in each of the, the waves. And how do we come, how do we get down to these, these 12? Yeah, you know, the, it, so the most famous first wave woman was Susan B. Anthony. There was a silver dollar made for her. And she actually is in the textbooks, unlike most, most women in history. Um, and so we, we figured, well, she's already had a lot of, um, yeah. You know, yeah, she's known. Yeah. 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 And there are a lot of other women as well. Um, but there are women that we don't know. And uh, so while Susan B. Anthony has the main quote going around that first mural, um, not another season of silence, um, at the other women there are both known and not so well known. So Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony for 50 years had a partnership. Uh, to, for women to have the right to vote, but also so that married women could er, have, it, are, were entitled to their own money that they earn, or a lot of other rights, the, uh, the ability to enter into a profession uh, that women were not allowed to enter into and so forth. So Elizabeth Cady Stanton is there because she's not as well known as Susan B. Anthony is, but their right. partnership really was from 1851 uh, or two until 192 when uh, Stanton died. So they were, they were called the most dangerous political <laughs> partnership uh, of their time. And uh, Alice Paul is somebody who was really in the, uh, the radical wing of the younger women who picked up the uh, leadership of the movement after 1900. And uh, Ida B. Wells is someone who was an activist in so many ways. Not only did she fight for women's rights to vote, but she also was a founder uh, of several black women's organizations. She was one of the co-founders of the NAACP. Um, and so for her, winning the right to vote for women was a matter of life or death because one of the main things that she worked towards was to end lynching and her anti-lynching movement tied in with her demand for the right to vote. And Charlotte, uh, Charlotte Baker, Dr. Charlotte Baker, uh, was our first uh, MD and very, very politically active and politically savvy and a power player in New San Diego after 1900. And so, 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 Sue, I know we're not going to be able to go in depth all on them, all of these right. women, but I want to ask you a question. When we got to the first wave, we had a hard time narrowing it down. Was there anyone? in the first wave that you really think that we should have been, if we could have fit her in somewhere in a corner, 
that you wish that we could have included and we have to cut her because of space. Who would you have said you would love to get her in there too? That's that's a, a hard, hard question. There, I, I can think of two really. One is Mary Church Terrell, who was oh, yeah. a, a black woman uh, activist and um, did so much. And um, and I guess the other one would be Anthony herself, because while people, I think that she's been um, she's been stereotyped in so many ways. Mm -hmm. uh, she was the one who was on the road and she was single. Stanton was the one having babies in a home and doing the writing so that Anthony could give the speeches. Right, <laughs> right. So tell us about the second wave. Why these four ladies? Oh, now this one was really hard for uh, <laughs> for us because you know Gloria Steinem is is arguably Gloria Steinem and Betty Friedan are the two best known uh, feminists of the second wave, but um, but <laughs> Gloria Steinem has had a TV series made of her on Hulu recently. She's gotten a lot of good press. So Betty Friedan did make it into it because her book, The Feminine Mystique, that came out in 63, really did help launch a mass movement um, that lasted for, for decades in the second wave. Um, and uh, Wilma Mankiller is somebody that people don't really um, think of when they think about second wave feminism because she was uh, the president of the Cherokee Nation and she was really known for her um, for participating in indigenous rights. But she and Gloria Steinem were very close friends, were in, in the feminist trenches together. Patsy Mink uh, and was a, 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 um, a elected official and Judy Baca has, uh, is very, very famous for her political murals and for her political activism on behalf of uh, Chicana feminism and on behalf of uh, Ch the Chicano movement itself. So we really wanted to get a broad range of people who you might know and mm -hmm. who you might not know. I'm really glad we got Judy in there because I understand uh, that there's gonna be a retrospective on her life and she's still living and so many of the women on our panels aren't living anymore. So just to know that she's still with us and we can still talk to her and maybe learn a little bit more about what was happening for her during the second wave. And so now we move to the third wave, uh, kind of where we are now, you know, they debate, are we in the third wave or the fourth wave or what wave? But it's kind of now kind of new. Uh, tell us about the women uh, in this wave and why we chose them. So the the women, the third, the third wave feminists really emphasize intersectionality. And, and that's a big word that means that all women um, are guide, not guided by, but are defined by a lot of things, by their ethnicity, by their race, by their socioeconomic status. So uh, to be a female is not just one thing. It depends on who you are and how all those parts of you intersect as, you, as a person. And so the third wave really, um, really emphasizes that diversity, but also about global issues that mm -hmm. all women globally have in common, but that really in particular emphasize, uh, really have an impact on women of color and uh, in the poor uh, members of of societies around the world. So for instance, violence against women is an issue for all women, but has a, has a disproportionate impact on women of color. The same thing is true, uh, true about the impact of global change, of um, climate change. Mm -hmm. And so climate change is something that affects all women, but when you look at what it's doing in poor communities, whether it's in the United States or anywhere else in the world, that is something that third wave women have really embraced. And those are just two examples of them. So I'll ask you the same question again. In the second wave or the third wave, who would you have liked to have squeezed in somehow because they were really, really also pivotal women in those two waves? Uh, um, oh gosh, and now I'm drawing a blank of the, the, the black legal feminist who really coined the term intersectionality. Um, um, oh, I know who you're talking about. Crenshaw. Yeah, yeah. Kimberly yeah. Crenshaw. Yeah, Kimberly um, Crenshaw, yes, yes. Kimberly Crenshaw, and thank you to my spouse in the next room who shouted that out to me. <laughs> <laughs> and um, 
so yeah, I mean, she she really she really uh, coined that term, and as a legal theorist, you know, has really done a lot to move move the academic ideas of the third wave into mainstream. Uh, and Rebecca Walker perhaps has done that uh, more than anybody else. Um, the other people that I would um, want to include, I think, in both the second and the lead into the third wave would be uh, the, the lesbian couple, uh, Martin and Lyon, who uh, really brought lesbian ideas into the forefront beginning in the 1950s, even before the second wave, all through the second wave of feminism, and then have been around to participate in, for instance, um, uh, gay marriage and things mm -hmm. that were part of the mm -hmm. third wave as yeah. well. So, uh, so yes, the, that Eve Ensler is, is a wonderful artist uh, writer. Uh, Glory Anzal Dua has, has done just um, amazing things in helping us to understand how people, how one person, one human being can themselves be a border, you know, between mm -hmm. cultures and between um, identities. And, um, and Janet, uh, Janet Mock too, who has uh, done, she's young, yeah. she's new on the scene, but, but it's all about trans rights, which is something that we haven't had a chance to talk about a lot. Absolutely. Yeah. She yeah. herself is also someone who is that, who has that, um, tr who transcends just one identity, which is what the Absolutely. Third well, everyone, we're going to be hearing a lot more from Sue over the next three months. Um, I, I mentioned earlier that we'll be introducing a series of panel discussions and uh, uh, Sue has volunteered, <laughs> graciously volunteered to facilitate those uh, panel discussions. I'll tell you a little bit more about those uh, later in the program. But now I'm, I really want, thank you, Sue, for, for that introduction to the, the waves of feminism in, in 10 minutes. And you know, that was, we're talking about how many years? <laughs> 50 years or something like that? 100 years, 100 years of history. Um, so now I'm really happy to introduce uh, Katie Ruiz, uh, the artist who brought the waves of feminism to life. Uh, what you should know about Katie is that she's a local Chicana artist who received her undergraduate training at Northern Arizona University and graduate training at the New York Studio School of Drawing, Painting, and Sculpture. Uh, she's uh, with faculty uh, with the San Diego Community College District. I love those community colleges. They produce great people and, and employ great people. And she's also at the Athenaeum School of Arts. Uh, she's a visiting teacher with the New York Studio School. So uh, welcome, Katie, and thank you again for answering the call, for saying yes when we put out the call for an artist. And um, I think the community is going to absolutely love and engaging uh, with your work. And thank you for producing the in process uh, video at the beginning of the show. It was, it was just, uh, you know, and I, I just got a sense that this was a very personal project for you, just not another gig. So just a few questions for you with my Oprah hat on. Um, so why did you answer the call? What was it about this project that intrigued you that made you want to work on the waves of feminism? Well, uh, thank you for having me and choosing my work for the mural project. Um, I saw the call out and I thought it was in alignment with my belief system. I have always been a feminist, whether the, that specific word resonates with people or not. I think, uh, you know, I've always fought for equality and I've um, every day start seeing more and more of those disparities between women and men, um, just on a daily basis as I educate myself in this world. And I've always had a real interest in who writes the history books and it sure wasn't women <laughs> and, um, the winners write the history books. And so in art school first, you know, in history class as well, the story just didn't really, I didn't see myself in the story. Um, and I am, I am mixed race and I, I do have a European background. And so I did see half of myself, but I was missing the other half of myself. 
And I didn't even know what a Chicana was at the time, um, but I knew something was off. And in, in community college, I wrote my thesis paper on women in the art because I thought, well, we need to know about these women. And so I thought I knew so much. And then I met you all. <laughs> And I was so flattered um, that you chose me. And I also think that my feminism has always come from a different angle. I was always had my, you can look at my work and it's super feminine uh, in a lot of ways, uh, very much about honoring cycles and very much about um, learning how to love myself as a woman. Mm -hmm. So in that process of self healing, I also became a feminist. And this has just become another level of it because um, as Sue helped us and we had these great meetings discussing these women where I, um, I said not as much because I felt like, gosh, they, you know, you were, are so educated and I've had clinging on to a few women and this really broke that open for me. So, you know, I'm really grateful to have learned so much. Um, so I bet those few women was Susan B. Anthony, right? You know uh, about her, right? So yeah. turn the truth, right? <laughs> For sure. Absolutely. Um, and then, of course, you know, because I had uh, this whole package of female artists I was really interested in as well. But I sort of had missed uh, some of the greater feminist classes. And I was thinking about this today. I've never taken a class on feminism. I've never taken a Chicano studies class, Alessandra. We're gonna to have to rectify that. And <laughs> I've never even taken a color theory class, but I, I sort of consider myself a, a very, having a lot of knowledge in all those things, but- um, Well, you were perfect you know, for the know. project. <laughs> Absolutely. So after you said yes, and you, you said, you know, we, we had a lot of meetings about this project. What did you find most challenging about getting into this, the, the heads of these women? And I know that you had to bond with them and learn about them. What did you find fulfilling and what did you find challenging? Well, uh, portraits are intimidating for one. Um, and I love, although I love them and that's what my education is in, you really want to honor each woman. And so I did spend time while I was painting each woman also watching YouTube videos on them and listening to their speeches and really trying to get a grasp on the, not just one thing each one of them did, but huge amounts of things each one of them did. And um, I know, you know, the process, uh, this, this handy dandy doodad, the iPad has changed all artists' lives who know how to use it. They even make a, a pencil you know, so I can draw like a regular artist. And I was able to draw those out um, once we decided on the women. Um, and speaking about the process and going into that, um, how the colors of the mood of each piece we wanted was gonna affect what we were going for. Um, I really, you know, think a lot about the suffrage movement and I think about the banners and I think yeah. about these ladies in skirts just yeah. going through the streets and everyone's like, who are these crazy ladies? <laughs> and, <laughs> and it seems so wild at the time. And now it's a really important pivotal thing to be able to do that. Um, so, and for the second wave, you know, we're thinking about the seventies and oh, okay. so we wanted to do more of those oranges yeah pop colors that really pop big flowers behind and have symbolism for each woman that depicted uh what they were doing and um i think one of the favorites is judy holding up her <laughs> fist paintbrush uh, and that's yeah. sort of a play on my printmaking class where i did a brayer um hand holding up the brayer with the sort of si se puede hand um, so coming up with, and the, the third wave, you know, all of us were talking, I, all we could think about was the wave of pink hats that we all saw. Right. That's right. right. It was just a huge wave of pink hats. And so that one seemed really applicable. It had to be pink. It had to be this 
big wave and with the the I am the third wave uh, token. That made a lot. The other thing I noticed about your work is that your use of your graphic design, it has the kind of kind of graffiti like it's kind of like you were there and you were just writing on the wall. Tell us a little bit about where that comes from. Is this more of a Chicana thing of uh, drawing on the, the graffiti or, you know, why the text? Hey, that's cool. I like, I like that. And um, I lived in New York City and I fell in love with street art and mm -hmm. I started looking up the artists whose work I would find. People like Swoon is one of my favorites. She was doing um, uh, wheat paste, but they're linoleum cuts. And I think that's also where my background comes in with that uh, bold lettering is the linoleum mm -hmm. cuts, mm -hmm. which is something I learned printmaking in Guanajuato, Mexico. Um, and it's interesting because I never considered myself using text in my work, but I, I sure do. You sure do, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to show. I made this poster right from printmaking class. Ah, uh, yeah. you know, and it's just, it is very, that once you get a cut like that and you cut the black and white and you see how powerful that is, I think you just become very drawn to that look. I love the look. So you fell in love with the women, but which one did you really, really bond with out of all the women whose faces you painted, whose portraits you painted, which one did you just fall in love with? Well, this is an easy one because at the time I was painting the murals, I was also doing a reading for the Museum of Contemporary Art on Borderlands. And they had, I, th I think about 50 Chicanos, bilingual people reading a chapter of the book. And I had not encountered this book before. And it was as if she was reading my soul. I, so which, which artist are you talking about for our, our listeners who don't know who you're uh, talking about? I'm talking about Borderlands, Gloria, which is a bilingual mm -hmm. text uh, about exactly what Sue was just speaking about, mm -hmm. being the border, being a cross multicultural intersectional person living on the border. And I came from that. Um, and wow, I just so <laughs> powerful. I really, I, I felt like I was looking at a mirror and it was just so beautiful. And so then I started reading all these texts more and more. And mm -hmm. whew, now, yeah. I, now I really am woke. <laughs> you're woke, you're woke. Well, we are too. Uh, and because of you, I hope that every person who happens to uh, walk by our murals that they become woke as well. Uh, our intention is to draw people in. Um, you know, we can just look at the murals and just for their own beauty, stop there. But you can go deeper and deeper and deeper into learning more about the women, the movement, and your own personal place in feminism. Like, where am I on these ways? Where's my journey? But thank you, Katie, so much uh, from the bottom of our hearts for being a part of our project. I know you're not going away. We're going to continue to go deeper and learn more, but it's a beautiful piece that just, it's awesome. And I think the community is going to really love it. So now talking about going deeper, um, we, we are an educational organization and we won't let you off the hook with pretty pictures. So Melissa, um, unmute yourself and tell us how um, everyone who engages with the mural can learn more about the waves of feminism. So one really cool thing about this project is that you can engage with it in many different levels. So there's, you know, looking at the beautiful drawings and getting introduced to these women um, and then walking by as you do. But then we're also having informational panels that will have little snippets and say, give you context for who these women are um, because we're a museum. And then, but on our website and we will have ways, if you're just walking around Liberty Station, you walk by our mural, you can scan a QR code on the mural and it will bring you to our website where we have digital exhibits on different eras of feminism. You know, we have a timeline of suffrage. We have a whole exhibit on women's clubs in 
the 1800s and the early 1900s of the groups who organized um, during the first wave to get the vote. Uh, second wave exhibit, and we're working on a brand new third wave um, exhibit to go along with this mural. And then in addition to that, this mural is gonna be really interactive. And not only are we telling the story of the past and the present, but we're also telling the story of you and the future. Um, so we actually have a panel on the fourth wave, but right now it doesn't have that much on it because it's waiting for everyone's answers, which is, you know, what is the fourth wave and what is does gender equality mean and what will be achieved? Um, mm -hmm. And on our website, you can submit your answers and say things like when a woman is president, when we have equal pay for equal work, mm -hmm. um, all these different things that you care about. Yeah, even uh, uh, when we re reproductive rights are, are honored for every woman. So I, I think our community is gonna respond in incredible ways, uh, particularly at this time where we have a heightened sense of, of where women are and where we need to be, uh, because we all know that we've been disproportionately affected by the pandemic, but at the same time, we are on the move. And so we would love it is when you visit the mural that you share some visions about where we're going and then we'll post them up, right? Yeah, yeah, you yeah. submit it, we'll print them out um, and post them all up. So it'll be a collage of everyone's um, responses and what everyone's you know, journey and ideas um, and what you guys are all fighting for in this long quest for gender equality. Thank you, Melissa, and you're in charge of that. And as, as you said, you're not stopping with um, just what we have. You're, you're gonna be creating some new uh, tools and resources for us along the way. Um, so to wrap up our program, um, I told you it would be brief. Um, I wanna invite everyone to stay tuned uh, for invitations for uh, a series of panel discussions we're organizing right now to look at the waves of feminism from three really important cultural perspectives. So starting in February, we'll host one a panel discussion per month, but starting in February, we'll be digging deep into the music of the eras. Uh, we all know that with every wave, there were songs that drove our spirit. There were songs that got us moving. Uh, there were these anthems and these songs that made us uh, uh, fight harder. Uh, you know, in the 60s, who, who won't ever remember uh, Aretha Franklin's Respect or Helen Reddy's I Am Woman, but every era had music that was the soundtrack for that era. And so we're going to bring in uh, music historians, people who are familiar with women's history as well as the music and, and help us uh, go deeper and understand uh, how music was an agent of change. Then we'll move on to the, to the films. Uh, we know that there are many uh, movies and films out there that um, drove the era and the era drove it. I mean, we, we have uh, wonderful buddy films and then we have the films that I'm still trying to figure out, like, why is Fatal Attraction such an, a wonder, I mean, not a wonderful film, but we keep seeing the same movie over and over again about crazy women who, who are Fatal Attractions. To me, this was a backlash against women. Uh, as women became stronger, then we have to be crazy. So, so we will bring in a film historian to unpack, you know, what, uh, how did film affect the movement and how did the movements affect film? And finally, we'll talk about the fashion. Uh, we've gone from corsets to go-go boots to uh, now with the sneakers and Kamala Harris and her sneakers, that becomes the new emblem of, of women breaking out and being free. Uh, fashion has always uh, led and been a part of the movement, the Pussy Riot hats and uh, t-shirts, um, everything along the way. I can't wait to dig into how women have evolved fashion and fashion has evolved our movement. So stay tuned for invitations to uh, those three panel discussions and be in the room so we can talk about it all together. It's um, been really a lovely uh, afternoon Go out and enjoy it, and then come back and see us soon. We have wonderful programs ahead for 2021. Thank you so much on behalf of the Women's Museum of California. Be well. 
Thank you.